Welcome back everyone. The, today's video focuses around my taxable account and where I look at sector allocations, targets, strategic decisions I made and direction that I'm trying to head. I hope you enjoy. So today's video is going to be me reviewing the stocks I hold in my taxable portfolio. <clears throat> this is going to be a lot of thinking out loud and looking at the things from a strategic and diversification perspective. Now, I do know, own the uh, many, all of the names, I think, discussed in today's video, and but that doesn't mean that they're right for everyone. Different people in different positions might not uh, want to own some of them or any of them, and it's so it's not investment advice, as always. But I will discuss where I am, my goals, and my directions that I'm trying to achieve. So I didn't put names because I don't want to get into every single holding I have, um, but this is what my portfolio looks like in terms of the size of the individual names in the portfolio. And in comes the big question, am I over or under diversified? to which half the time I think each side. Now feel free to let me know what you think if I am over or under diversified. Um, I'd, I'd really interested in the arguments for either side um, looking at this. And this is what it would look like without the two big outliers that I'll get to in a minute. So as you can see, Excluding the two big pieces of pie, the rest of the portfolio looks kind of more reasonable and more how I would historically have structured it. I also want to take this opportunity to point out that I make an embarrassing number of mistakes. Um, every time I look at the portfolio, I'm reminded of how much room there is for improvement. and. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I try and get better, but still, like whatever I do, whatever I'm doing, no matter what's going on in the portfolio, there was always things that don't go as planned. And I don't think it's possible to eliminate all of that, but I I want to, and I'm just want it to be very clear that you know. Some things go right, but some things go disastrously wrong, and it bugs me, particularly when I say it out loud to other people, if you know what I mean. So you could count if you want, but there are 26 names in the portfolio. Now, three of them, I would say, are too small to matter, and another few are very small. Um, but the breakdown goes like this. There are mistakes in there. Six of the names in that list are red since I bought them. Now, maybe a few more than that have been disappointing recently. Uh, a bunch more have been essentially flat recently. Um, five maybe are up slightly recently, and you know, there's a few that have done decently. Now, overall, there are seven or eight, depending on how you want to qualify running a buyback, but seven or eight running a buyback, which I like having some of that type of exposure in my portfolio because it means that um, share prices being lower um, means a higher return without having to buy more shares because the company is doing it itself. So when I'm when I own a company that is running a buyback, I am perfectly happy with the shares going down in price because of market volatility. 20 of the 26 pay dividends. That said, I would exclude at least four as not paying a relevant amount of dividend. And if we're talking ones that have a decent yield of either dividend or some type of distribution, there are 10 and the portfolio yields about 
Now, one thing I would add is that in a few cases, to the point of the people who would say I'm overly diversified, which probably I am, in a few of the cases, there are multiple stocks that amount to the same thesis, whether that's multiple gold stocks, multiple uh, auto part stocks, things like that. So I'm not as diversified as that amongst the uh, all the positions that are not the top two. I should also probably, um, now that I'm looking at this and now that I'm kind of going into more details, there are some positions that can disappear because either they're small positions from a long time ago and not really relevant, um, either because they have underperformed or the market, or the, my portfolio has kind of outperformed, or maybe I started buying something and um, the market took off and so I have a tiny irrelevant position. So there are some things like that. Um, that maybe drags over time, so maybe I should just cut them and move on. Um, there are also five positions in there that I would call commodity price trades. And so hopefully in favorable positions, uh, for favorable conditions that I can move on from those and redeploy the cash elsewhere. Now, before people start commenting about whole bunch of things, I will point out this is only the taxable account that I'm looking at today. So when I'm looking at sector exposure, I am overweight the AGs. Well, one at least. Um, real estate, I'm overweight, particularly again, one position and I have positions in a number of other sectors, including home builders, which in this case does not include the dream segment that is home builders. I have positions in energies, gold, utilities, technology, some cyclicals, and some that I just kind of consider as dividend slash dividend growth type of place. You know, as you may have noticed in the first chart that had position sizes, there were two outliers. And those two were Dream and Verde. Now, Verde started as a single digit position as of the last time I was adding to it and has amounted to um, today 38%. Dream, as of when I was adding to it, it was high teens, uh, which is very large for a position for me. And in the year since, it has grown to about 23%. Now, the reason I don't have less of these is because I believe they are both still um, at least worthy of holds into the near and probably distant future. Now, the current shape of my portfolio is born out of decisions probably made about a year ago. A year ago, I was arguably ridiculously overweight, um, certain types of risk and risks that were kind of highly correlated. And back then, what occurred to me is that you need to behave stylistically differently with different parts of your portfolio. For example, if you are trying to make as much money as quickly as possible, well, then you need to be a very right, but there's a specific type of um, portfolio you need. You need probably high risk assets. You need concentrated portfolio. So let's say you have one very good stock. Well, that's, you know, if you have the best stock, you will have the best performance if you're all or levered long that one stock. Of course, if you're wrong in that very risky stock, then it could be a zero. So in order to survive, you need a certain number of positions. But if you're going to try and make a, a significant amount of money, you need to concentrate the portfolio and have call it 5, 10, or 15% positions, for example. However, if you're trying to be defensive, if you want stability in your portfolio, well, then you need, well, it might 
be beneficial to have more smaller positions that will over time just kind of grind higher because again the goal is not uh, with that portfolio not to strike it rich uh, quickly but to have good returns over the long term and an added point tax efficiently now the other thing that I really wanted to do with my portfolio because it was not the case before that was have it set up so I was less concentrated in risk factors. I didn't want one thing to move the entire portfolio in the same direction. It is not great for uh, mental stability. Um, so in, in the same sense, I wanted to be able to be set up so that if I ever got a significant winner, that I would be more comfortable sitting on uh, the winner for as much time as it deserved without trimming and shedding gains for um, the sake of being responsible. So that means within my portfolio, I would need two sub portfolios, essentially. One to play defense, the other to play offense. On my defensive portfolio, I decided I would look for mid-teens uh, internal rate of returns on investments, investments that I thought would give total returns of, call it 15% approximately, over the long term, and ones that I would not have to sell. And, you know, at heart, I am a never sell type. I like that it's tax efficient. I like that it, it, it is simple and um, the patience involved is um, relaxing. So it's, it's a good way to have a, I thought it was a good way to have a backbone uh, of the portfolio, something that would perform in all environments, ones that you wouldn't have to try and um, predict a thesis, a cycle, something like that. You could just um, have the stock perform, have it maybe distribute in all environments and just go up, essentially. I should note that while this sounds good in theory, in practice, being defensive doesn't necessarily mean being right. You can still suffer big uh, falls in share price and you could still overpay. And a number of the defensive plays that I've been in have not necessarily done well. Now this concept can also take many forms and so some of the ideas that uh, made sense for me when I was looking at trying to come up with a bunch of smaller position names for a defensive portfolio were all sorts of different things really everything from REITs to uh, Acon to Brookfield infrastructure to Constellation Software, which some would call a tech stock. Um, and really, the, the idea for this was all weather total returns, whether that's some type of distribution, uh, return on capital, growth, or you know just the regular company with uh, growth at a reasonable price, dividend and dividend growth. So, some of these have worked better than others. I really dislike that. Um, I, I really dislike it when I mention something here that then proceeds to do poorly. Um, I can also say that, you know, things change over time. So which ones I'd be willing to allocate capital to, you really need the style and the price to fit. So things don't work all the time for this, but this is just kind of my thinking. And so this leads to what I will call the offense. And that means in my portfolio of all those stocks, there are probably five or six that I would call offense. And these are multi-bagger potential um, trying to make money and I need to have in order for it to work, I still need to have a relevant position in them, and that's hard when I'm more capital constrained. But 
have a relevant position and, you know, then be able to wait. Because historically, for me, even when something works well, it will often take a year, two years of doing nothing, essentially nothing first. And, you know, I, I also need to restrict, especially if I'm going to be limiting the number of positions and targeting um, multi-baggers, I need to restrict what I will call a fishing expedition on speculative junk. So I can't, I need to have companies that kind of first and foremost won't just implode. Now, again, I could be horribly wrong because I will be horribly wrong sometimes. So I need to try and limit how horribly wrong I could be and try and find places where they shouldn't just implode for no reason, but they could explode for no reason. Well, for a reason. Um, and the other thing is something I learned about myself over the past number of years is I'm far more comfortable sitting on something that will add a little bit of value, a little bit of value, and then maybe if it if things go very right, it will go up, I don't know, a, a smaller multiple versus something that will just lose value day by day and then maybe explode. I find it far more I'm far more comfortable sitting on the positive slope versus the negative slope. Now, I, I'm just, some people are smart enough to be able to do the opposite. I'm not, and I, I don't feel comfortable with it. So um, I more so try and focus um, relevant or larger positions on the positive slope. Now, of course, there are some times where there might be a situation where I put a small position in something, but I really, I learned about myself that I don't like it as much. Now, when it comes to goals, I would say I have three loose goals. The first one is uh, performance on the account. So my goal from here is about plus 5% by September 13th. No, not my birthday or anything, just, um, goal based on a prior goal and uh, so that one is would be far simpler than the well far more likely I don't know if it will actually happen than the goal of plus 32 percent by year end which would be difficult uh, but not impossible realistically though it will come down to Verde if they um, if, if they manage to reach double digits by year end and one or two other things go right, then it is makeable. Um, if Verde doesn't work, then it would take, well, it, it probably won't happen. Now the other goal or goals is not really performance based in the near term at least. And here the goal is to diversify without diversifying. And basically I will need to build new uh, catch up positions. So positions that will outperform um, my larger positions, which if my larger positions do well, um, will be difficult. But I need to find new um, outperforming stocks that are preferably not agricultural or real estate and ideally not a commodity in general, although, you know, I don't have any rules against it. Um, and I will need to find these positions and make them of relevant size and find things that can outperform the rest of my portfolio. And in a, in, because I have this defensive segment of my portfolio and because I have it set up the way I do, I will allow myself to um, go to a max of about 110% long. I don't really short things, but 100% long, 110% long, I should say. And 
yes, I need to build a relevant position in the next big winner. Now, the problem is, I don't know what that is. Other problem, I don't know when that will be, but that's kind of what I'm working towards now that I have the defensive portion of my portfolio um, more so filled out than it has been and at a scale that makes sense for me now. Now look, if Verde continues to do what I believe it can do in terms of performance, then I will likely fail at performing at, at, at the second goal, at least, of building some relevantly sized catch-up positions. And honestly, that it would be my preferred way to fail. Um, because my, my issue these days has been that the returns in my portfolio um, basically boil down to what does Verde do? And when it's doing well, that's very nice. But I still prefer having um, the ability to have multiple ways to make money versus having one. Don't get me wrong. If I'm going to have a single stock um, dictate the direction of my portfolio, I'm very happy for it to be something like Verde. And, you know, hopefully someday, you know, if, if Verde goes well, then I will hopefully be able to catch up eventually only because it will reach its peak and then give some nice dividends and make it up that way. But if it goes well, it could be a long time before it is not a significant part of my portfolio. Now, seeing it as, as it is the most relevant position in my portfolio, I figured I would give a little bit of commentary. Now, base case, the base case that was given in uh, out of the January guidance, we're a few months ahead. And you know what? Most growth stocks are at least that at all times. And here it is, There's this is a significant growth stock. But longer term, and especially with any tax implications, I really don't think it makes sense to substantially sell, for me at least. I, I know there are probably people out there um, who the position has got too large for comfort um, or in, in this or something else. And if those people want to trim, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It, it's, it's important that you're able to sleep at night. Um, but when I look at the forecasts, I think the forecast from January might be getting stale because again, the January forecast was 700 tons at X price and 1,400, uh, 14, 1.4 million tons um, in the next year. Now, February had um, a bit of a boost to that perhaps. And when a major producer declared force majeure, um, and then March had the Russia-Ukraine war, I mean, Russia invasion of Ukraine. And then we're, now they're talking or implementing or talking about implementing a export ban on fertilizer. Now, Russia and Belarus are significant uh, producers of uh, potash. And if there is an overly tight market. And if there is a shortage, well, that is a human tra tragedy. It is positive for the growth of Verde. And so, you know, if there's, um, if there is a shortage and if there is a real reason to own things like Nutrien and Mosaic around the current prices, I think that the guidance for what Verde gave might be stale and they, you know, will only be able to see in time, but I think um, they could do perhaps more. We'll, we'll see again. Um, but I do recognize that there is reflexivity in the situation in that a tight market might be more sales at a higher price versus a looser market. If a few things don't materialize, then it could be less set, less volume at a lower price. And, you know, this is the analyst's nightmare right there. Um, you can give uh, two price targets that have, you know, miles apart. 
The only other thing I'll say is that I'm familiar with the numbers we've seen in the spot market, and I know of the capacity constraints and where guidance is, and I know that all of it won't materialize, but I hope that much of what could materialize does. There's plenty of room for investors to be well satisfied out of that. And I guess I can also give some brief dream commentary. Now, like Verde, it, this was a stock that has that I really liked, but also has outperformed my expectations. Now, the NAV that they use is 60, and I'm fine with that. Um, the gap between the share price and that current uh, continues to indicate what the yield would be on a buyback. So, you know, $50 versus um, $60 NAV means the buyback would yield 20% and, and so on and so forth. So um, as that closes, they should be able to spend more money on outward growth instead of inward growth. And I have to say the growth in this company over time in their um, value per share has been very impressive and very consistent. Um, K-Side is huge and amazing and if you don't know what i'm talking about google it um, because that is in my opinion amazing uh look at the pictures i that's all i can say um now a few of their arms um office is has been recently approaching nav if they can get that to trade at a premium to nav which would be a nice step forward um, but that would give their asset under management um, the ability to accelerate in its growth. Also, they kind of teased at a apartment uh, vehicle in the dream name, which could also um, perhaps, if that could trade at, a, uh, at NAV or more, could give them another way in which they could accelerate the asset under management growth, which is already growing and has potential over time to grow at a faster pace and on a capital light uh, basis so that they could keep spending money on either uh, growing per share or growing. Um, and at the same time, they can grow their value via the um, asset management business. So I still have confidence that uh, over time, day by day, the company will be worth a little bit more every day. And that is exactly what I would want out of a large position. And with it still trading at a discount to NAV, a NAV that is going up um, over the long term, I don't feel obliged to sell. And this is the ideal um, type of compounder that so as I mentioned, I am primarily going back on the offensive side after spending some time building up the defensive side, going back on offense. But now my issue is I have very limited room. I need to build up substantially sized positions, relatively speaking, um, and they need to be good enough that I can make them relevantly sized positions, and they need to have upside potential. Now, obviously some will fail, um, but I'm hoping that a few can succeed with enough upside potential to move the needle. And I can shift around my portfolio a little bit, but there's not a lot of room to add to new positions. And I do think that plenty of the things that I own in my portfolio, I would be happy to own more if I had the capital, but now this is um, constrained in that sense. The current, some of the current things that I like, um, or I'm starting to like, is uh, industrials and tech, and specifically, and those are long-term likes, shorter-term likes, kind of like um, gold, and uh, there's infinite frustration in me in in for the gold sector i'm anyway um i i i feel like i should like it 
but I feel like I should give up on it also. And uh, so gold is one, and I kind of like home builders still, even though um, you know I think I think the we need to price out some rate hikes, but um, very I think is a very strong sector continuing going forward. So in summation, the good side is I'm satisfied with the diversification and uh, defensive side of the portfolio, which means that the fresh funds can go to um, opportunities where I could make um, multiples or real money on, on the return side. Now on the bad side, savings and the 1% yield that I get from dividends are less effective than they've almost ever been. And not only that, I have very little buying power without adding to, to a margin, and adding to margin is um, not ideal um, without a very good reason to. So slow progress, but I'm satisfied with where the portfolio sits. There's also the point that I mentioned before in that some of the current positions are potentially recyclable or trading positions and that could open up a little bit of space but again it takes off um, one region of offense to maybe set up another which I will do if there's if I feel like there's a very good reason to and um, the, the defensive side also provides enough flexibility that I wouldn't feel uncomfortable using some of the margin buying power. And again, in the short and medium term, my returns are heavily influenced by Verde. So if Verde is successful, which I hope it is, I won't be able to diversify adequately for a long time. And that's okay. If I fail that way, I will be more than happy. I will also say that this strategy was something that I came up with for me. This this is not what's best for um, you know many people I know. There's maybe one or two people that I think would benefit from this, but most people would probably want to do something completely different and it is definitely not the safest way of reaching a goal it is not what i'd recommend for most others um, it's very important to know yourself and you know you'll probably learn a little bit incrementally incrementally about yourself as you go and your investing uh, tolerance and style so that is a, a long way of saying um, do, it's more important to do what works for you than what works absolutely. And I don't even know if this will work absolutely, but it is something I am prepared to do because of how I set up. It probably isn't um, what you should be prepared to do or what others have uh, set up. In conclusion, I'm back on offense for hopefully most of the funds going forward. I will be trying to grow through selective addition, and I, I believe that my defensive segment should offer fine or better returns as a whole, um, including the mistakes uh, within it. Now, as always, this is not investment advice. Um, ideas, comments, questions, or concerns are all welcome. I'll read them all. Um, thank you for watching. Have a great day.